So David, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, Harry mentioned something that I, I just want you to ask you to, to, to tell us a little bit more about, uh, about the adherence and, and uh, you know, this is a chronic treatment. Patients right. take a pill and they have, it, it goes on for a long time indefinitely. We're starting to assess this continuation, but at least for a very, very long time. Right. So um, how relevant is uh, assessing adherence? I mean, does it matter? How, how do we do it? Yeah, no, I think it is very important. As Harry said, there are studies showing somewhat intuitive, perhaps, that uh, patients who don't take their drugs uh, don't do as well as those who take it. And uh, uh, there's also data showing a very large proportion of patients. I think it's something like 85% of, of patients with CML are, are not consistently adherent. And I think that's, that's an important issue we need to be aware of. I think there are two sides of it. One is the patient who is feeling well, their disease is fully controlled, they're not having side effects from the drugs. It's almost like they don't have a reminder that, ah, there's something wrong here, I need to take, be sure I take my drug um, uh, to remind them every day. And so people busy with their daily lives, they tend to forget, especially you know, if it's a drug that they have to take more than once a day, there's even more chance that they'll, they'll miss a dose here and there. So I think that's one part of it. The other part is, is some of the issues that Harry mentioned about the ongoing kind of nagging side effects. Um, you know, for most of the patients, the side effects that occur, which are common, tend to be low grade, grade one or two, and they tend to be transient. Um, uh, however, we know that some of the patients have ongoing low grade, ongoing toxicity that's kind of always there. And um, that might be a reason for them to say, oh, I, I need to take a break, I need a little holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's important to be aware of that. We do have choices of, of, other, of other TKIs. And uh, if it's a, an issue about this kind of uh, nagging ongoing side effects, that's something to address and potentially consider uh, a change to allow them to be um, more adherent. Yeah, I think that one of the most, uh, perhaps the, the, the most uh, telling studies, this one from David Marin, who who showed among these patients who have been on treatment for a long time and then they measured adherence by this device in the cap and, and he showed that patients that had missed 10% uh, of the dose, um, the probability of achieving these deeper responses, MR 4.5 was 0%. So it doesn't take too many doses to, to miss and, right. and, uh, and, and that's why some of these recommendations actually tell us that when the patient is not reaching these endpoints, the first thing you do is check adherence um, and, and, and what is maybe interfering with adherence because it's very important. So. And, and I, I echo what Harry said about meeting on an ongoing basis with, with the patients. Um, my patients know that I'm gonna be checking the PCR and they often kind of confess uh, to me, you know, oh, I took that trip uh, out of the country and I, and I left my drug at home. You think that's gonna show up? Um, and likely it, it, it will, and, and I think it's important to emphasize that. Okay, so, so let me move now, I mean, a lot of this, what we'll be discussing has to do with, with the monitoring of the patient and, and uh, uh, all of these uh, aspects that are so critical for, for assessing the, the response. Uh, so how, how, how do you monitor patients, uh, Kevin, in, in, in the clinic? Uh, talking about like a newly diagnosed patient, how do you do the monitoring? Yes, certainly. Um, I tend to follow the NCCN guidelines and for safety considerations I check CBC and chemistry every two weeks for the first two months and then I pay close attention to the three-month BCR able uh, time point as this is a key milestone as we alluded to earlier uh, because patients who achieve BCR able less than 10% at three months have a better overall survival. Uh, of course we don't necessarily need to act immediately if they're slightly above 10% so we have that six month time point too where we can make a change particularly if they're still above 10 percent at the uh, six month time point and then i continue to check bcr able every three months uh, until the patient achieves a major molecular response you do have the option then to maybe extend it out to every six months but as harry said we like to see these patients on a frequent basis so typically if they're coming to the office anyhow we'll continue to check their bcr able so every three months then when the patient reaches BCR able less than 1%, which we said was kind of equivalent to a complete cytogenetic response, we uh, oftentimes do a bone marrow biopsy to confirm the presence of a complete cytogenetic response. So we've moved away from doing a lot of bone marrow biopsies, and I think a lot of patients are very grateful for that when we can check uh, BCR able. Uh, but there still is a role for bone marrow biopsies, particularly when the BCR able is hovering above the 1% mark, and we want to confirm that they've lost a complete cytogenetic response. 
Harry, how often do you do the, 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 the PCR on, on your patients? Um, and does well, it change over time or, or is it constant? Well, the, the first point I'd like to make about that is I always do it at baseline. Mm -hmm. And it's not to get a patient-specific value. That's not really the importance, although there is some data from Australia that how much it goes down by three months might be as important as this 10% level. Um, but the real reason for doing it is that there will be rare patients who will have variant fusions of BCR and ABL where the commercially available PCR assays will not detect it efficiently. And so the best time to understand this is when the patient shows up and they have a white count of 100,000 and you get a BCR able result of 0.1% or, 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 or negative. Um, so I do all three assays at beginning, chromosomes, fish, and PCR, because that's the best time for, to, to have your baseline. And then you, can, then you know the assay's informative. And then I do it every three months, starting at three months. Um, and I do it um, to make sure they're meeting their my, milestones. And I always also do it as a way of checking adherence, because we all know that a PCR uh, level that um, let's say the patient has, has gotten into a major molecular remission, but one time it come, it, they come in and it's just a little bit higher. So it went from 0 0.02 to 0 0.08, okay? And it hasn't gone up tenfold, they haven't lost an MMR, we're not so worried, your nurse calls the patient, and the patient gets the result, and they're worried. Mm -hmm. And they might say, eh, I, w I didn't tell Doc Erba that I was not taking the drug. I'm going to make sure I'm a little bit more compliant. So I, I think using it also as a way of ensuring compliance um, can be very helpful for our patients. So at baseline in every three months. And I continue to do that. Patients who achieve a complete molecular remission who, who live far from our center, maybe every six months.